All right, welcome back. We are almost into our final talk of the day. Uh, what a day. <laughs> what a day. Uh, we were just discussing in the green room about how uh, 10 and a quarter hour conferences are quite taxing, but um, I definitely wouldn't change it. So many fantastic talks today. I uh, just want to give another shout out to our sponsors. Obviously, Container Solutions doing so much of the work behind the scenes here, not to mention Ricardo and all the people in the booths who are um, you know, making, making this successful. Plus, our other, uh, other, other hosts, uh, Leon Lee, Ellen Corbus, who's been with us for the first time. I'm so glad that Ellen's joined. I remember the last one when um, we had, I think, 25 minutes per talk, no changeovers, no breaks. Uh, just having an extra person today has been incredible. And I'm looking forward to going back through the videos and seeing how all those talks were. One of the, one of the problems I have with hosting one of the tracks is I don't get to see the other ones until later. And then I have to remember them all and come back to them later. Anyway, onwards with the uh, sponsors. Equinix Metal, of course, um, Cycloid, Giant Swarm, Instana, and Kinfolk. Um, I'm not sure if people will still be in the booths, but I would definitely go and check it out. I believe they have interesting games and fun gifts. Speaking of gifts, Container Solutions today sponsored the 200 t-shirt giveaway. Um, you didn't have to do anything to be part of that. If you registered, you will automatically be part of that and we'll hear about it. We also, after this next talk with Ian Coldwater, will be announcing the winners of many of the competitions. So that is the pumpkin competition, the costume competition, and the cocktail competition. I can already see the winners. You can't. So we'll reveal those uh, not long from now. We're just waiting for Ian Coldwater to show up so we can get into the last talk. Um, I was just saying to Ricardo, the person you don't see, who does all of the magic, connecting all the Zoom meetings to other Zoom meetings and making sure that everything goes on time, that the last time we did this, uh, we were late for pretty much all the talks. We were constantly in the organizer's channel trying to figure out how to buy a couple of minutes here and a couple of minutes there. And this time, I think I've been in the organizer's channel about twice. So if anything, we're getting a lot better at this. Um, it's kind of fortunate that the talk that's going to be late is the last talk, because after this, as I was just saying to some people here in the green room, we're going to do the last call after this to announce the winners. And then I'm going to fall into a deep, deep slumber. Oh, wait a minute. I see Ian Coldwater. Hello there. Hello there. My name is not Ian Coldwater. My name is Baba Yaga. How are you? <laughs> Very well, Baba Yaga. Nice to have you here. Sorry, there must have been an administrative error. I got your name wrong. Uh, let's just get your slides lined up and then we can jump straight into it. That sounds perfect. You know, uh, apologies for the technical difficulties. It can be hard when you live in a forest in a hut on chicken legs. Yeah, how's the Wi-Fi in that forest? It, you know, it's up and down, but you know, we're making it work. I mean, it seems pretty stable right now. So let's just, just stay exactly where you are. Don't move that the laptop. So and hopefully it's going to keep working. Okay. Um, let me... Um, do I share my screen first? I should know that. Yes, please. Okay. Um, play. And then... All right, we're looking good. Okay. So just before we get started, obviously we're starting, uh, let me just check the clock here. We are starting uh, 10 minutes late. So we're gonna be going into the spooky closing remarks, which remember are where we're gonna uh, announce all of the competition winners, uh, 10 minutes later than expected. So aiming for 9.25 p.m. London, 10.15 p.m. Uh, Central Eastern, uh, Central European time, and don't make me do the maths on the US. Uh, Baba Yaga, are you ready? I am ready. Take it away. Previet, um, I am billed here as Ian Coldwater, but today my name is Baba Yaga. Forget what you heard from the Hollywood action movies. Baba Yaga is a ancient figure of Eastern European Slavic folklore. Um, I, Baba Yaga, 
predate not only Hollywood, but Christianity and, record, and written records themselves. Um, Baba Yaga is an old woman, uh, sort of uh, translates into grandma witch, who lives in the woods in a hut on chicken legs. Baba Yaga does not walk. Her hut walks on the chicken legs, sometimes it dances, and she flies um, in a mortar using a pestle to steer. So flew over here to Software Circus to tell you a story. Intrepid Explorer, I see that you are approaching me. That's a brave move because Baba Yaga is, cha is canonically chaotic neutral. Sometimes she helps the heroes that come in and ask her questions if they approach her politely, if she finds them interesting and finds them worthy. Sometimes she eats them or otherwise causes problems on purpose. So I appreciate you coming in. I, th I think we're gonna make this work here. Let's go out and explore a bit. I live in a forest. It's a terrifying forest, a scary place, a bramble forest. It's full of birch trees with deep roots and dependency trees where the branches are all entirely intertwined. And not many dare to step into this forest because the roots are exposed. You can't see through it. It's so dark. You don't even know where it goes, how deep it is, or what's in it, what horrors may be lurking within. So we're going to take a tour together, take a look into the bramble forest of the software dependency supply chain, figure out some horror stories and figure out if there's anything good that can happen in there. But approach with caution and keep your wits about you because you don't know what's lurking in there. This is my hut on chicken legs in the bramble forest. The bramble forest in the clouds was a wicked place full of unknown dangers. The dependency trees had exposed roots and branches so thickly intertwined you couldn't tear them apart. The paths forked and no one could be sure how far they reached. Pitfalls were everywhere. I live in this forest with my creatures, with nature who I control. As a pre-Christian goddess of death and rebirth, I control the forests, I control the seasons and the forest creatures are my friends. We work together, but sometimes those forest creatures may not be friendly to you. What unknown dangers live in here? Let us go and count the ways, if you dare. So taking a look in there, let's, let's look at some issues that can happen. The software supply chain itself is so deep and so thickly intertwined, you know, some people might call things spaghetti code where everything touches in ways that you can't necessarily tell. And my cousin Strega Nono over in Italy likes spaghetti. But for me, I, you know, I'm a forest creature. I like this metaphor. So we don't even really know what's in here. Any given company, any given organization, any given system doesn't necessarily know its assets. What's even running in there? What are the dependencies? What are their dependencies? Do you know? I would argue most people probably don't. And when you have such deeply intertwined dependencies, this can cause some problems. Um, one of those is that often we have open source dependencies. We don't necessarily know where they come from. We hope for the best. We don't necessarily know who's maintaining them. And again, often they have dependencies on one another. Also, often they are intertwined with closed source dependencies in which you actually have absolutely no idea what's running in there. You're just not going to. And when those things work together, that if there's a conflict, what happens? If there are open source dependencies on the lower levels that underlie closed source projects, open source projects, projects that are yours, projects that belong to other people completely, that can cause other sets of problems. Because A, again, what's even going on in there? B, how would you know if something bad happened, would you? Maybe you wouldn't. And what happens if you don't? We have examples of this. If we shine our light into the bowels of recent history, we can see examples of things like Ruby gems, NPM modules, and other dependencies that were widely used, um, where those things were hijacked so that what looked like a legitimate repo 
was in fact not a legitimate repo. It was something else, maybe run by somebody who wasn't friendly at all. But people being trusting would assume that that's what is going to be the thing that they want, continue to download it, and then get malware in their systems. This can happen a few ways. One, um, there were examples recently of somebody taking things over from a burned out open source maintainer, we all know some, who didn't want to deal with it anymore and handed it off to someone who offered. Which, fair enough, but on the other hand, that person who offered was not friendly and in fact put malware on this repo, which was the same repo as everybody was depending on. It can also happen in container registries. Do you have image pull latest somewhere in your system? Most people do. Okay, fair enough. Is that connected to any kind of known SHA or any kind of indicator that there is known good there? Maybe, but also maybe not, because if it's image pull latest, do you necessarily know what that's going to be in advance? If you have image pull latest or things that are just trusting that whatever in the registry is what it's supposed to be, then it might not be what it's supposed to be. And honestly, how are you gonna know? Also across registries, how are you going to know that something that is named, you know, the thing that you would expect it to be is actually that package across registries. If you know that this one is on Docker Hub and is legitimate, and let's say as a horror story example, that Docker Hub starts messing with its anonymous pull numbers, maybe people will start moving to other registries. And maybe in those other registries, those packages that are named the same thing aren't maintained by different, aren't maintained by the same person. Maybe not all those people might be friendly. At what point, A, do you know, and B, do you have a plan for that? Now would be the time to start making a plan for that because the registries aren't checking. So you really have to be because a lot of people are going to be moving. And in general, if there's a dependency somewhere along the chain, we're all sort of depending on each other for CVEs and things like that to be reported, but we're not necessarily threat modeling or keeping an eye out for somebody hijacking that, hijacking the update, hijacking the repo, putting something that is similarly named somewhere else. And that's problematic because those are unknown horrors lurking in these branches that are so deep and thickly intertwined that you can't necessarily see in or through them. Another issue is if somebody does find a vulnerability, well, what happens if they're forked and then they're forked and then they're forked. Does anybody actually know how far they go? I would argue not necessarily. And if you fix it, you know, this far along the chain, but it goes indefinitely, are people continuing to use this dependency that is problematic somewhere along the chain? Probably. So all of these are unsolved problems. And I'm not necessarily coming here to be able to, to give you definitive solutions for how you can fix those in your organization, except to threat model, keep an eye out, download from trusted sources, and do your best to know what you're running and what that's running in there. Um, and I guess those are solutions of sorts, but it's going to be different for everybody because threat models and systems are different for everybody. But if you're not keeping an eye out, you need to keep your eye out for that. And, uh-oh. What happens if somebody finds something that is a lower level dependency that touches a lot of other things? It happens. Do we have a plan for that? This is a real question because not everybody does. The CNCF as of right this minute does not have a standardized disclosure process for what happens if somebody finds a bug across a lower level dependency that touches multiple CNCF projects. I bet a lot of foundations are like that. And are the vendors speaking to one another? You know, if one public cloud has an issue with a lower level dependency, are they communicating with a different public cloud? Are the vendors talking? Do people have a plan for themselves? And do people have a plan together for how to coordinate if something, if something happens that touches all of these things across? Right now, the answer is no, people don't. And that is problematic because at some point, it is not entirely unlikely that something might happen in which people are going to need to figure out these kinds of coordinated disclosure processes on the fly. So 
This is what I am suggesting, both for your organization, if somebody finds something in your software supply chain, and for everybody working together, because I do actually think this is a thing that is at least sometimes going to require us having to work together. Um, if somebody finds something, A, be cool, don't threaten to sue them or throw them in jail. That sort of seems funny and like it's obvious, but it actually happens all the time. And if somebody is coming to you with a bug to disclose something, it's safe to assume, I think, that for the most part, unless they are trying to ransomware you, which mostly people aren't, they're mostly trying to act in good faith. Um, but it can be really hard as a security researcher to report bugs to people. A, not everybody does assume that you're going to act in good faith. There's risk to it. Um, people have been threatened to be arrested or sued before. And B, there isn't necessarily, um, not everybody has a plan for what to do if somebody finds a bug. And not everybody has a process for what to do if somebody finds a bug. So if a researcher, you know, as somebody who finds them, I'm like, okay, who do I contact? And ideally you have security at whatever your project is and you have somebody who's watching it, paying attention to it and responding to it, both in terms of literally responding to the researcher and in terms of, um, you know, responding to it in terms of mitigating the bug. Um, ideally you have that, sometimes you don't. And then it, the burden comes on the researcher to go and try to like chase down whoever this belongs to and ideally, that person knows somebody who knows somebody else and can find a maintainer who they can talk to. But sometimes they just can't and there's nobody to be found. And then what do you do as a researcher at that point? Your options are relatively limited and not great. You can drop a no day in public, uh, on stage, on Twitter, on the virtual stage, wherever. You can continue to search indefinitely while this thing is open and vulnerable. Um, you can sell it on the black market, which I don't necessarily recommend for multiple reasons, but that's not ideal because if we want people to be able to responsibly disclose the bugs that we have so that we are aware of them and can fix them, because we're not always going to be aware of the bugs that we make, right, in our systems, like it happens all the time, people file bugs and there are straight up security bugs and sometimes there are just bugs in software that become security bugs for one reason or another. So. We want to find out about those ideally, right? We want to fix them because we want to build good systems and we want to do good work. But we need to have a process for how people can disclose those and a way to work with those researchers well so that A, we can become aware of them and fix them and B, so that we're not being assholes to researchers. Excuse my language. Um, so, okay. Any given company needs to have a process and I would argue that there should be standards about those processes. Um, you want to have, again, a security contact that goes to an email that somebody watches, that somebody responds to, and then you need to be responsive both to the person who finds it and in terms of fixing it. But then again, what happens if there's something that is a lower level dependency that touches multiple projects? Okay, so project A, has a security contact, somebody checks it, they're very responsive. Project B, which this lower level dependency also touches, doesn't have anything at all. The security researcher has to go try to run around chasing them down. Project C has an email that somebody checks, but no plan as to what to do if somebody finds a bug. So somebody answers and is like, um, cool, thanks, I'll get back to you. And then nothing happens. Project D, threatens to sue the researcher. Cool. Well, what happens in practice here? Project A is gonna be okay. They found it, they fixed it, it's chill. Um, the other ones are going to be in various states of disarray, but realistically, a lot of them are going to be less secure than they would be if they all had it together. And if it is a lower level dependency that touches multiple projects, if they have a plan with one another, that actually creates more security for everybody. Because A, people don't have to individually scramble, either as people, as orgs, as projects, whatever, to figure out what their disclosure process is going to be. 
if, or to set one up, if there are standardized understandings of like what that looks like. And B, if there's something that vendors need to talk to one another about, which we all know everybody is 100% great at all the time, then there can be standardized processes for what happens if the vendors need to talk to one another, because sometimes they're going to, because you want to be able to trust that if something happens with a lower level dependency, that it's going to be fixed across all of the things that are going to depend on it, or at least as many as possible. Because again, it's hard to know. Um, the paths fork, how far do they go? Can we even find our way out of this forest? Who even knows? But when we're running around with our skulls on fire, trying to get out of there, it's good to be able to have something like a map or a plan for a way out. Do we have one? Do we have one individually? Do we have one together? So in order to avoid this scenario where somebody shows up with their bug and everybody's running around with their eyes on fire and their hair on fire, not knowing what's going on, if we come up with these plans individually, according to a standardized process with known standards, if we connect it to things for incentive, like in order to graduate as a CNCF project, you need to be able to have these kinds of standards. You need to be able to have a security contact who responds, you need to have a plan. And if these like projects, vendors, organizations, whatever, have plans with one another, then when the worst case horror story scenario happens, people are going to know what to do. Because right now, to be honest, they don't. And that is a horror story because we all want to make good systems. We all want to do our best work. But when we don't make contingency plans for frankly resilience, which is a word that we usually talk about in other contexts, but which I would argue applies to security too, then we get caught unawares in the forest where unknown dangers can put us in greater danger. Let's make a plan both for ourselves and for one another with a map that we can see, we can share, and we can follow. And that way, when the worst case scenario happens, we'll be able to find our way out. And that is my argument. Thank you. I am Baba Yaga, a Slavic goddess of death and rebirth. And I appreciate your tour through my forest. Now that we have created this lovely map together, we are going to be able to find our way out and through. Thank you very much. Baba Yaga, thank you so much. And now you're just showing off. You truly are magical. You were 10 minutes late for the talk and that somehow you finished 10 seconds before time, which is very impressive. Um, <clears throat> The only question we have is whether or not the slides would be available. And I understand a lot of work must have gone into those. And yes, we're going to tweet all those things out, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to speak to Baba Yaga, I can, um, I can tell you Baba Yaga's secret, uh, secret Twitter handle to be able to find out. Everything else in the chat was, uh, <laughs> was basically just praise. Uh, great talk, honk, Slavic goddess. Great storytelling with awesome slides, kudos, great content, great slides and graphics, awesome slides, very creative talk. I mean, it goes on and on. I would really encourage you to uh, to go and go and scroll back through later. I'm pretty sure you'll you'll, you'll be impressed with the amount of love you're getting. Uh, thank Baba, you thank you so much for the talk. We really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me on. And I'm on Twitter as Ian Coldwater. If you want to come nerd out with me about coordinated disclosure processes, anytime. Thank you.